Welcome to Leveling Connections. Uh, today I'm talking with Blake Irving, uh, who was a longtime executive with Microsoft, uh, Yahoo, and the CEO of GoDaddy. Today he's on several boards, great companies uh, like Autodesk. Um, and uh, today we are talking about certain leadership and um, certain aspects of corporate life. So with that, uh, hi Blake, how are you? Great to see you, Thomas. Good to catch up a little earlier. Yes, I mean, uh, we haven't seen each other for a long time, but, you know, it's it's great to use this format of uh, communication with teams. Uh, it certainly brings us all a little bit together. Well, I mean, the, the, the advancement of video conferencing technology over the last 18 to 24 months has been pretty remarkable and life-changing, certainly for me, living in yes, our emotions. Uh, right, absolutely. So, uh, let me start with one question. Uh, when I was preparing for our talk, I saw an article published in 2016 in the New York Times uh, with you where the title was, at the top, you get to set the tone. Has that been your mantra of leadership during your different careers at Microsoft, Yahoo, and GoDaddy? Well, yeah, it's, it's uh, when you're not at the top, and if you're at Microsoft, you know, it's, it, it, <laughs> There's a lot of room between just about everybody on the top. Um, I, I think that the CEO has the ability to set the tone for the company in a way that employees that are running a division can't. And I, and I would say at Microsoft, whether it was my team with MSN or it was Jay Allard which, with Xbox, that we had different cultures, but we were still very tied and very importantly part of Microsoft's culture first and foremost. And then you might deviate a little from that. As when I was the CEO of GoDaddy, we had this you know wonderful culture that was there that the founder led, Bob Parsons, who was a, a w wickedly bright guy. But he had his he had his culture, and then but there was a lot of things that people weren't really happy about uh, the culture. They were embarrassed by some of the commercials they had to deal with. They weren't super happy with how they were treated because of those things. And so I, I started asking people, "What do you want this place to look like?" Like. Mm -hmm. What if we take a little bit of all the things we thought were great cultural attributes to all these companies we're hiring people from, you know, Microsoft, uh, PayPal, eBay, Google, like we had a bunch of folks across the company and we just started asking them, what do you like about it here? What would you like to change? Uh, and then got to actually lean in really hard to this new culture that we were trying to build centered on customers primarily, our small business customers and what we wanted to accomplish for them. And it was it was that was probably uh, one of the I'm, I'm sort of a culture first kind of guy. So it was really important for me to feel like we could set that cultural tone and then have everybody in the company kind of snap into it and say, like, wow, this is this is a way better, this is a way better place. than I've been working and it feels like me, you know, people would say it feels like me. Uh, this feels really good. So to be able yeah. to set that tone and have people follow it was I thought was a really fun Super fun thing to do, and it was effective. You know, we took the company public, got it out, had a good, uh, had a really good uh, IPO offering. Never broke issue. I just kept, you know, kept going up, and it was uh, people were digging it. It was a, it was a really fun place to work. Yeah, and and you're right. I mean, Microsoft was a different place because we had we had these these uh, big dudes, yeah, Steve and Bill, looming right. over, and you know, in every meeting there was always Bill said, Steve said. You know, right. the, the two things, and that was kind of like the religion. But on the other end, you were right. I mean, uh, our divisions also look different. And even right. there, you know, from the top, you could set the tone in different ways of where you wanted to go. It had to be in the framework. Right. Um, then as a CEO, you have, of course, more leverage um, yes. to do that. But you already uh, mentioned uh, inheriting, you know, a certain culture. I think when you started GoDaddy, you inherited a mix of advertising messages that were not always considered appropriate. Yeah, how did you change the public perception of the company and make it a powerhouse of corporate advertising? Well, uh, let me say this. I think again, I'm going to go back to Bob Parsons. Bob Parsons was the guy that made it, you know, a powerhouse of corporate advertising, and he did it in in a a way that was brilliant and controversial. You know, as controversial as it was brilliant. And you know he he did it he did it kind of in a way that was a little misogynistic on the on the back of women and treated them as uh, objects of beauty in, in commercials and what uh, 
when I got there, I was going to try to figure out how to square up what we do and who we do it for with the way that we're positioning ourselves and portraying ourselves in the public. And this is one of the things that, that the employees that I would talk to when I did my you know, 100, 100 one-on-ones with people in the first few weeks that say like, you know, I'm really uncomfortable with the way we portray ourselves. Like if this feels bad, I mean, I, I have to apologize on phone calls with people when I tell them that I'm there. And I remember talking, talking to a woman who was at a trade show in Austin, Texas, and, you know, she had people coming up and going like, hey, are you a GoDaddy girl? <laughs> you know, and, and she said uh, it was really it was really defaming for her. She really felt horrible about it. So I was just like, well, let's just do this. Let's let's go ahead and portray our customers the way that they would want to be portrayed. By the way, 50 percent of small business owners in the United States are women. They shouldn't we be treating them like they are good business people and not just, you know, good looking. Um, and so we just switched it. I just basically started messaging in the company. This is what we're going to do. Uh, started the first ERG, Employee Resource Group, which is uh, GoDaddy, GoDaddy Women in Tech uh, with Arana Wasti. And we got that thing off to the uh, running and say, hey, we're not going to have GoDaddy girls anymore. We're going to have GoDaddy women. And you're it. And you're really good at what you do, whether you're in engineering or you're in finance. And, and you're going to be able to tell people very proudly that that's, that's what we do. And, and Karen Tillman, who was my chief communications officer, who literally just left to go to Brex, I think, uh, probably it's about eight weeks ago. I just got a note from her from Recode this morning. Mm. Uh, I, I, when, I, when I hired her, you know, the first repulsion was, go, Daddy, what are you, what, are you kidding me? Why would I do that? And they're horrible. No, this was re- the action, reaction yeah. women would have. And I'd say, look, if you want to be part of a story where we get to pivot the culture in a 180 degree different way and do it in a way that are gonna, is going to honor women and make them feel like they are very important. They're essential to small business in America and essential to having great engineering teams and tech companies. If you want to be part of that story and help, help me craft that, let, let's go do that. Uh, and she came on board and we just had like a five year fun fest creating that reality uh, and having, you know, I'd say an un, um, we had we, we were punching greater than our weight. I, I think we actually had a, a better ability to move the industry because Bob had been so controversial on those first ads. So when we moved in the other pivot, it got noticed immediately. And people were like, oh, man, it, these guys are different. And honestly, had Bob not taken that position, that controversial position, wouldn't have been able to have, you know, 85% brand recognition, which we had, wouldn't have been able to actually shift what that brand intent meant, you know, and, and we, we had, we ended up having, you know, I think really good sentiment and our sentiment was very bad earlier and people still knew who we were. And that yeah. was, that was largely credited to Bob, I think. Yeah, no, I mean, in, in a sense, it was an opportunity for you to change and right. be the agent of change. And, you know, a lot of times we come into companies where, you know, we improve you know, here the 10%, 10%, but we can't, yeah. you know, go, go, uh, you know, dramatically into a different uh, situation. Right. Well, well it, it, and it turns, turns out you, you, you have to take, if you're going to make, you know, big changes, you have to take bold and scary steps sometime. And, you know, I ended up getting in a lot of arguments with board members and with Bob on t- doing some of these things, uh, but it was the right thing to do. And, you know, when yeah. you stand on the side of right, uh, and you feel like what you're doing is righteous and it's serving the com- serving the world well. Uh, it gives you, it makes you feel like your 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 sales are full and that you're doing the you're doing really good work, not just for your company but for the planet. Yeah. Well, you know, and I I saw also you know a lot of you you know on social media. Um, you know, I think during your tenure at GoDaddy, you were very very active on social media. And portraying yourself a little bit, well, cool as GoDaddy, yeah, <laughs> showing your personal side and your passions. Right. And was that a deliberate strategy uh, to show how you see life as the CEO of GoDaddy, or was just just a natural fit? No, it, I think a little bit of both. So one of the things when I got to the company, I, I was told, that, "Okay, man, people don't put pictures of themselves up in their cubicles. They don't feel like the, you know they're not supposed to wear a baseball hat. They're, they can't wear flip flops. There's there's a bunch of rules, you know. And and the previous CEO was a Marine, and he was pretty rugged. And so you know, I think you want to bring your best self to work. And I think the people that do the best job at that are the people that are the same people they are at work when they're at home." 
right? They're just, this is who I am naturally. This is what I'm going to let you see. Um, and I'm, you know, the same person when I'm talking with my kids as when I'm talking to you guys. And that means, you know, I'm a drummer, I'm a skateboarder. I do all these, you know, things that are really important to me for fun. And I'm bringing those to work. So I literally had a drum set in my office. I had a balance board in my office. I'd skate all around. We actually built a skateboard park when we built our Tempe facility. Um, and there were, you know, tons of other people that wanted to do those same things. And so to me, that was one of those things that was also part of shifting the culture so people could be themselves and bring their best selves to work and show pictures of their family and like bring things that are hobbies that make them more interesting than just being, you know, one automaton who's sitting in a company just churning away at whatever their job is. The stuff that's the most interesting about people is who they actually are. Uh, and so if you can get people talking about who they actually are, which I always do in, you know, group one-on-ones, uh, it just makes a different environment, a different culture, more inviting, more connected. People tend to be more loyal when they feel connected. So I'm a big believer that that's a, a, a sincerely good way of acquiring and retaining employees who want to have a have a bit of themselves and that and who they really are in the office. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, you know, I was always uh, uh, thinking that, you know, I, I spend so much time in the office, you know, I should have in the office the stuff that I like, you know, right. I have my pictures, um, you know, I think in, in the screen you can see, you know, one of my model ships that a friend of mine builds. It's an art, you know, thing. Yes, yes. And so, you know, I, I always say, you know, put the stuff from home in your office. Yeah. Uh, you know, be exactly. yourself. No, absolutely. Um, on another topic, I saw that in a recent post on LinkedIn, you wrote about the effects of COVID-19 on the employees of companies. And as you say, the amount of angst and stress employee population are going through because of the added pressure and uncertainty of COVID. I mean, right. often we only talk about the new hybrid office and what's more effective. You know, I'm actually, you know, more on the stay in the office than at home. <laughs> I'm kind of yeah. old fashioned because I think of communal creativity and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But sure. uh, what, what you bring in is a different dimension and uh, of what does it do to people um, in this COVID times. And um, it seems you see a dimension that has not been debated enough. Yeah, so I serve on a, a few boards, ZipRecruiter, DocuSign, Autodesk, uh, FlowHub, and it, they've all gone hybrid, right? Mm. And the people like to work with other folks. They like looking at them in the eyes. They like being around real people. And so, you know, I don't know how many people have uttered, oh my God, I can't do another five hour Zoom meeting. You know, I mean, it's a pretty right. typical thing, right? And mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, you have young people with children that are working at home and they're trying to figure out how to carve out their workspace while they have a five-year-old that's, you know, under their desk, you know, or, or people that 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 are just lonely, yeah. and and the uncertainty the uncertainty that was introduced by COVID of when can I go back to work, am I going to be able to maintain a job? Is my company doing well because of COVID? Are they a beneficiary, or is it going to you know tear my business apart? And I had one company that had to lay off fifty percent of their employees because yeah. because the 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 market for employment went down so dr dramatically. All of those things create more and more angst. And I think uh, that, that particular post was about uh, a, a woman who I know that is doing some really interesting work on helping people kind of get underneath their angst and try to find peace uh, and mindfulness in a way that allows them to not be as, as freaked out or hard on themselves or uncomfortable or angst ridden. Um, and I think that it's, you know, anxiety and angst is, is something that just exists in our business. If you if you don't have any anxiety about your business, you know, I can't believe everything's going so well that you wouldn't have. It. There's got to be a little bit there, right? Well, and, and so, you know, I mean, we, we learned it, you know, look over your shoulder. Where's your competitor? You know, right? uh, you know, nice. look at, you know, what what mistakes did I do today? Yeah. What can I do better? There's work and, work. Yeah, there's there's <laughs> there's plenty around. And and I can also see that as you say, job security. I mean, if we have a very, very um, successful hybrid model or remote office, and some companies had that 
forever in a sense right. that I remember HP where every team was. Yeah, my boss is there and my teammate is there and all over the world. They were never together in an office. And I always thought that is, you know, not very effective because you can't talk together in real life, perhaps at a sales meeting or something like that. But right. when it comes to it that you have um, the ability to work wherever you want to, that also means that the employer can hire wherever they want to. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Game and so, yeah. So why should I hire in San Francisco or in Silicon Valley when I can do it in Oklahoma and get the same people? Perhaps you don't. But I mean, they have smart people as there, well. There have been or, people that have been leaving the Silicon Valley to go other places because they don't like the environment. It's too expensive. It's too crowded. What I mean, I can go to Reno and I can work from Reno and have the same effectiveness. You know, and honestly, if you think about the tools we have today, you know, you have GitHub, you have Slack, you have Zoom, you have Teams, you have, you know, a, a WebEx. You have a lot of really powerful tools that are allowing people to feel connected. They're not as connected as they are when they're in the office, but you can get a lot done. Yeah, so my, if, my, if, son's, if, yeah. my son's startup, Dondo, he actually is based in Bogota, Colombia, and has you know, employees all over the place, Argentina and Medellin and Barranquilla and in the States. And, you know, it doesn't matter. Right. Yeah. And that, I mean, if I would be a Silicon Valley uh, employee that says, well, perhaps I'll go out in the suburbs. Well, if, if then I can also hire somebody somewhere else, you know, for half the money. So Absolutely. There, there is then this, this imminent angst that will come about because suddenly you're much more changeable yeah, it's not you're not in the Silicon Valley market anymore where there's hardly anybody to find or in Seattle. I can't hire anybody <laughs> because <laughs> between Microsoft, Amazon and all these people, you know, we as a smaller company, we can't even pay for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so that makes it all very difficult. Um, but I mean, it's a, it's a good debate to have because the psychological situation of people yeah, is, you know, not in the picture right now. It's only sometimes debated, and that certainly needs a new debate. You're right. Um, you were talking uh, um, when you came into GoDaddy and and changing the view of women. Uh, that seems to be you know you know long term you know thing that you are doing. I mean, in 2015, you were the executive producer of Code Debugging the Gender Gap. Um, you have been a long time advocate against the gender gap, and for more diversity in technology company. Clearly, in, in today, 21, there's more debate about it, but it's still more and more about, oh, you have to hire more, you have to hire more women, and, you know, it seems that we need to start much earlier and look at the early education and the real equal opportunity for learning, um, as you show in your documentary. Right, right. So that I think... Um... Debug, de debugging the gender gap was a good example of, of showing it professionally, but really didn't cover the pipeline issue as much as that's what you're talking about. Um, and you don't have a lot of young girls that say, hey, I want to code because it's been portrayed for so very long as being a man's or, or a kid's or boy's mm -hmm. uh, thing. I think we're seeing that we're seeing some pretty dramatic changes over the course of the last, let's just say, five to seven years where I think you're finding younger girls that are um, getting in it, girls who code, black girls who code. There's like great organizations now sponsoring the work that Hadi Partobi's done, you know, Day of Code, which is incredible. Um, th th I think there are more and more diverse folks and more women getting into coding. But it's, it's a combination of a pipeline issue and then there's so much evidence inside of businesses that, that women will, will end up bouncing because the environment isn't isn't right for her. And, you know, maybe they'll have a kid and they'll figure out how to get the one kid covered. And if they have a second kid now, somebody's got to make a decision who's going to end up staying home, uh, whether it's the husband or the wife or, you know, maybe things change now because we're in a hybrid environment much more than we used to be. But I, I think that it hasn't been it, it, it hasn't been a level playing field for a very long time, all the way from elementary school through college up until up in a business. And I know that when we were doing our first um, salary exploration, which I published publicly at, at the Grace Hopper conference, I think in 20, 2015, 2016, um, we, we showed salary data that indicated that women were making about the same as men in GoDaddy. And I didn't believe it. I thought, 
that doesn't make sense to me. Said, so let's go find out what they're, how quickly they're moving through uh, different levels, right? So I think that their promotion trajectory is probably um, not as steep as guys. And so what we discovered was that, you know, a, a, a guy who's 35, and this is Clayman Institute research, guys 35% capable of a role says, I'm ready right now. And a woman who is 85% ready for a role will say, you know, if I have that extra 15%, I'll be ready. But because of the, you know, just the genetics of, you know, what, what guys, how they hold themselves, how they think about it, they will demand a promotion from a, a, from a boss and a woman won't because they think that they're, it's going to be, they're going to be recognized for their work and, and that, and they, they haven't been. So what we did at GoDaddy, um, we made sure that everybody was reviewed for promotion the first three years they were on the job. First three years, everybody, regardless of whether they were asking for it or not. And what we saw was a, an increase in female promotions of 30%. No change in guys. The behavior didn't change. But managers actually had to start having conversations about promotion with women without the women having to ask. And it completely changed it. And and one other thing we uncovered, which is craziness, um, I'll call it pay it backward. We had two people that were interviewing for vice president of product management gigs with us one year. A man, one was coming from Microsoft, one was coming from Oracle. The Oracle person, the, the man came in, negotiated his deal, you know, blah, 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 ends up getting the deal two weeks later. We make an offer to the woman. Same job, Thomas, exact same job. And so, I, I we're walking out to the to the parking lot, my senior HR, my CHRO and I, and I looked at him, I go like, so what is this person getting versus that guy? Like this woman that we just hired into the same role, what what is she getting? What di deal did she negotiate? Have we looked at their salaries side by side? He goes, no, we haven't. I go, I bet you money that she's making less. Mm -hmm. And so we walked out to the car. He goes, I'll go check. So he goes back in the office, comes back. He goes like, you're right. Bonus and stock were the same because that was by level. But the salary that she had negotiated was $25,000 a year less than the man. Because she had carried her, you know, what, what do we do? And we're promoting somebody into a new gig. It's like, oh, we'll give you a 20% more than you were making. So we look at his number. We give him 20% more. Yeah, and we look, we at, look at history. Yeah. yeah. And so we, they're carrying their job inequity and their salary inequity with them to the next place. And so we, we basically uh, rescinded our offer to her that Friday and you know, she was freaked out and we're like, don't worry, there's a new offer coming. And it was giving her the exact amount of money that the, the guy we had hired was making. Uh, and you know, that, that became so important to let people know that we were willing to go do that. And we're a small company. It's hard for a company like Microsoft who has, you know, hundreds of thousands of employees to do something like that. For me, you know, we got a you know, couple thousand engineers in the company. It was pretty easy. Yeah, although, I mean, Microsoft has all the tools yeah, and has the manpower uh, to do that. I think they probably have more issues, which is more hiring. Uh, it's more right. mass than, it's than just sometimes mass. quality and, and they can't find them here. They they go overseas and hire mass people there. I mean, that has certainly changed. And yeah, I don't know what's easy. I think it, it does start with the top. If you don't have, you know, the thinking about it, then uh, perhaps it will not start. Um, I think that, you know, you have done an amazing job and um, it's absolutely fantastic to see you in the industry and, and certainly to see you as a board member where you can guide other companies in that direction. Um, so um, it has been, you know, fantastic to hear you about these issues and um, thank you very much. Appreciate oh, it pleasure. and we'll talk soon. Yeah, thanks, Thomas. I really appreciate it. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks.